All right, uh, I've met most of you already through labs, but I said I'd introduce myself properly today. Um, what I'm going to go through first is quickly go through the course introduction and then the first lecture. Uh, the first lecture is always fairly short. It's usually planned to be the first week of school, not week two of school. First week we like to keep our lectures short just to make life easier for people, but you know, such is life. It's still going to be short. All right, but before I start teaching, I usually like to introduce myself personally so you guys have a bit of an idea where I come from when I go to teach you guys. I'm a college graduate, like you guys are hoping to be. So I don't have a degree. I have a three-year diploma. And it was a school of business. Yeah, computer programming back then was part of the school of business because people were writing information systems, not games. Games were like hobbyists and enthusiasts that tended to do that. Um, so, you know, so I come from, I graduated in Canada College in 96. It's been a few years, just a couple. Um, I've been working as a professional developer ever since. I had a job a week out of school. In the last 23 years, I've been unemployed a grand total of three weeks. There is lots of work in this field. As long as you're willing to work and you don't get too picky. Now, if you want to be a Shopify type person, you might have a hard time finding a job. You know, it's one of those things. I work full time and I teach part time. There's implications for both you and I for this. One, it imp implications for me means burnout. Implications for you means I'm not as available all day. So don't point asking, can I meet you tomorrow in the morning? The answer is no. Why? Because I'm probably at my day job wanting to rip out my hair. It is what it is. Um, I, but that also being said, I tend to answer my emails very, very fast. Often I've actually, actually answered emails before somebody sent me their second email. So I may not have regular office hours, but I definitely have regular email all the time hours. Um, currently I work for a company called Catlink Technology Corporation. I am almost guaranteed nobody in this room has ever heard of them. In the last five years, I've had one student know who they were. Um, if you've ever worked in the sign industry, then you've heard of them. Uh, the company I work for makes software for sign making. So you know when you see those nice big billboards? Yeah, there's a 55th chance our software printed that billboard. We control like 60% of the sign making market. How big are we? 45 employees in Ottawa and a handful elsewhere in the world. You don't need a big company to mark corner a market. You just have to have decent software. And apparently our, our reds are the best reds in the market, whatever that's supposed to mean. I'm partly colorblind, so me red, red is red. Um, but you know, we're told that our reds are some of the best in the market. Uh, but I'm not a desktop developer, I'm a web developer. And network admin, and database admin, server admin. I wear pretty much every stupid hat you can ask for in a small IT company. Uh, I started as a web developer, and some unknown reason they gave me a lot of the admin networking stuff. Um, so that's my background. So what kind of person am I? Um, I have a loose and easygoing teaching style. Uh, my class notes are my PowerPoints. I've been working with databases for over 20 years. I've been working with Postgres for 14. I know this stuff intimately. Thus, I don't tend to have a, a pre-canned lecture because I go based on the feedback from the classroom. You know how some teachers will have a, a script that they insist on following and you know, God help you if they don't get to finish it that day? That's not how, how mine goes. Um, I'm sarcastic. Some of you may have already experienced it. I apologize, not really. Um, that's just who I am if I do, but you know, I'm an equal opportunity offender. That means I'll probably insult everybody in this room at least once. Uh, I will pick on you. I don't, it doesn't mean I don't like you. It just means I'm picking on you. Don't take it personally or take, take it seriously because I'm not men picking on you because I want to be mean to you. It just what happens that you got my attention that day. And if I do say something that offends you to the point where you're really mad, after class, come and see me and I'll try to, and tell me what it is I said that pissed you off. 
And I'll try not to say that again. So that's my caveat. You know, I, yeah, I've already hit a couple of things in the past that people didn't like, and I've learned to work my way around it. Uh, I had to give over some of my examples because somebody was offended on my particular wording. But that's how it is. Um, by the same token, um, I'm not very politically correct. There may be bad words. Sorry if bad words offend you. That's not going to change. Just toughen up. Because you're going to hear lots of bad words if you plan to work in computers for the rest of your life. Uh, we've been compared to sailors. Yes. When things go bad, we get very creative with our language. Because uh, it's a high-stress job sometimes, and high-stress tends to make people less... So I work for a living, so I have less of a filter than some of the other profs I've been teaching for 40 years. That never really worked. So it is what it is. Um, now, I also understand that life happens. I've, in the last year and a half, my life went to shit for about a month completely. And I totally understand when life goes to shit. Hey, it happens. However, if your dog eats your laptop three times in one term, you know, the second time, probably not going to be leaving you too much on the third. So, you know, don't st if you're going to have issues, at least try to come up with new ones. <laughs> Every time. I don't mean like, yeah, I totally, I, hey, I'm not kidding. I've actually had a student that proved to me their dog took a piss on their laptop. Just saying, it's happened. I've witnessed it. The guy sent me pictures of urine pouring out of his laptop. So, yeah, there wasn't much I could say about his story because it was totally believable. You know, um, by the same token, I will give extensions uh, within reason. So if you have a good excuse of why something can't get done, and you can prove it to me, and being hungover is not a good excuse, just saying, or that you've been blazed for five days because you had too many edibles, that doesn't count either as good excuses. On the other hand, if you're sitting in the hospital with a dislocated knee and you can prove to me you were there, usually a selfie in a hospital bed works great. I don't want any gore. Don't do gore. But, you know, that's what I mean. Like, I'm fair, like, you know, as long as it's reasonable and you can reasonably prove to me you were unavailable, I'll take it. If life emergencies happen, I'm reasonable. Just, you know, hopefully your entire term is not one long crisis. Because that's when I run out, run out of patience. Okay, textbook number one. There used to be two textbooks to this course. We're down to one. If you bought it, get your money back. You're in CET, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you don't need this book again. Unless you plan to take uh, the database elective, which you can take in like level four or level three. One of the electives later on, you might want to use it then. But by then, they'll be on a, to a new edition anyways. So save your money. Um, the appropriate readings can be found on Brightspace. We'll, we'll put it with that wording. Okay, here are my rules for success in this class. Come to lecture. However, I don't take attendance. Why? Because if you're sick, I don't want you here. I don't want you infecting the rest of the room. Some of us get sick really easily. If you're sick and you're hacking up a lung and you're snotting and you're wiping yourself off on your neighbor, okay, no, dude, that's not cool. I'll get around to why I don't care about attendance in a few moments. Do your work. Surprise. If you don't give me anything to grade, you're going to fail. You give me stuff to grade, I'm pretty lenient with my grading. I'm reasonable. Give me something to work with, and you'll probably pass. As long as you give it more than like five minutes of attention. Hand in your work on time. This applies to the assignments and the tests. Um, assignments have a late penalty. So if you are one to seven days late, you lose 10%. More than seven days, I give you a zero. I have other things to do. I'm not, as I've said to other students, I'm going to treat you guys like adults. Adults don't chase adults around for their work. If you're at a job and you get told to do something and you don't do it, guess what happens to you? You get fired. I'm not going to chase you. I'll usually send out one warning saying, hey, by the way, this is due tomorrow. And then, hey, by the way, the drop dead date's tomorrow. And then I don't care anymore. Zeros are the easiest grade to give because I don't have to look at your work. 
I just go zero, 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 zero if anybody didn't submit stuff. Simple. Uh, now, if you don't hear me assign something in class, then it's not due. Fairly simple concept. We, the old LMS we used randomly like changing dates on us. As in, assignments would suddenly become due that weren't assigned yet. Magic. Uh, Brightspace is better, at least I haven't had my dates change on me yet. But if I haven't said in class, this is due, or I have not sent out a written announcement saying this piece of work is now due or due on such, such a date, you know, then it's not due. Don't panic. I don't need 25 emails saying, oh no, this looks like it's due. No, it's not. If I didn't say it, it's not. Don't panic. Okay, labs are due by the start of the next lecture, technically. Realistically, they're due at the start of the next lab. It's just I have to put a dead line in the sand. So, for example, for lab one, I don't really care because, you know, if you can't get lab one finished, you're not going to have a computer for the rest of this course, so you will get that one done. But for the other labs, I have to give you guys a deadline because people are just going to sit there and submit nine labs at the end of the term to me. That's not cool either. So, realistically, labs are due at the start of the next lab. It's just as a generic slide I use every year, and depending on how the lectures versus the labs line up, you know, sometimes that's fair, sometimes that's not. In this, this case, it wouldn't be fair because the guys on Thursday have two days less than everybody else. So it's due at the start of the next lab. Okay, what can you expect this term? Lectures, labs, assignment tests, and a two-part exam. Surprise, it's like every other course. Um, lectures are free form. I don't lose lecture notes. I've already warned you about that, so don't ask for them. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation is my memory tool. Um, labs are gradual and they peak by in difficulty by week nine. Week nine is, you know, pretty damn hard, nine, ten. So it's fairly like this, although lab five tends to be, depending on how your brain works, lab five can be painful. But it's not a programming type lab, it's a concept, concepts lab. So people have sometimes have a hard time with concepts. Uh, assignments are submitted by Brightspace and I always give you two weeks to do them. They're not brutal, so there's no excuses. This is not going to be like a level four uh, CPU architecture course where you have to write your own CPU. I've had students do assignment one in two hours. And what happens also is the week after I hand out an assignment, I, I don't have lecture that week. I, it's a work period. The entire week is a work period. So I give you guys four hours to do what some people can do in two. Some people need more, I'm just saying, you know, I've had done as low as two and I've had as much about six. Um, tests are online and I give you a week to do them. They're take home tests. Tests in the, on Brightspace in the classroom is totally useless. Can anybody tell me why? Because if you're sitting in the front row, everybody behind you is copying you. The only people that aren't copying are the guys in the rear row. Online tests in a classroom setting are useless. From my, even if I shuffle and randomize it, there's still a 50-50 chance you're going to have at least similar questions like the person ahead of you. Therefore, you know, if you've got good eyesight, you're like, oh, no, oh, no, no, that doesn't look right. Well, but his, look, oh, share hers is good, <laughs> right? I'm just saying. So I do them as a take-home test. My tests are actually really hard, just saying, because I actually forced you to do some research during the test. Not all the answers are on PowerPoint. You may actually need to go look things up a little bit. You've been taught what you need, but I'm, I'm a, a, you're, it's open book, so you can go look stuff up. Yeah. What about, uh, it will cover like 90% of the tests. There's about 10% where you're probably going to go look something up because I may have used slightly different wording in the question. And I'm trying to get you guys used to understanding the fact that in computers, people use different words for the same thing. So the tests are not killers, but they are, they can be challenging. I do ask that you do the honest thing and you do it on your own. You know, it does show up when five people submit within 15 seconds of each other. That usually tells me I had five people that sat together and did it. Can I prove that? No, but I tend to ask, to please don't do that. Or at least if you're gonna submit them as a group, stagger them a little bit, so it's not so obvious. All right. 
Which leads me to my attendance statement earlier. You see the camera, little, my little camera there. You see I'm wearing a microphone on my face. I record my lectures to the best of my ability. It's not a guarantee. Things happen. Last term, I accidentally hit a key on my keyboard and my recording stopped and I didn't even know and I lost a whole lecture. Because apparently the recording software mapped the same keystroke for stopping recording as my software I used for running database commands to so the same command as run. So every time I hit run, it would start, stop, start, stop, so the lecture was sliced in like 30 second increments. So that was a useless lecture. Uh, I have fixed that shortcut, but I don't guarantee, there's no guarantee the lectures will be there. I do my best. Usually within 24 hours, they're up on YouTube. I say up to one or two days because sometimes I just don't have time because I have life outside of school. And my channel is there, but if you go to YouTube, you search for CST8215, you'll find my channel. I've got years of lectures there. And you could actually, if you really feel like taking the time, you could actually watch how the course has evolved or devolved, depending on how you want to look at it. And my lectures for the Linux course is there too, and the, my lectures for a different database course are there too. So there's all kinds of content on there. So <coughs> what will you be learning this term? Basic database design. By the time you're done here, you will not be a database architect. Don't get your hopes up. You will understand basic database design theory. You will understand what diagrams are. You'll know how to read a diagram, both the conceptual and the physical diagrams. You will learn this stuff, but you will not be an expert at it because you haven't done it for years. But you will understand the basic concepts. Again, same thing with SQL. You're going to get about solid four weeks of SQL, dedicated lectures for SQL. Some people like it, some people don't. Suck it up. SQL is not that bad. Um, compared to Java or Bash, it's great. Um, they're going to learn about views, sort about triggers and stored procedures. That content's very thin now because we had to trim a week off the course. So that, that was one of the victims because you now get a fall break. That means there's one less week of instruction. Yeah. And then there's other stuff, time permitting, that you'll learn other things. And other stuff, you'll also hear a bunch of anecdotes of every time I screwed up during my career. Because I like using my screw ups as examples of what not to do. And I've been doing this for over 20 years, so I've done lots of screw ups. All right, here's how your grades are broken down. Labs are 10%. Quizzes slash hybrids are also 10%. Do your hybrids. I've actually had someone who would have had an A plus not do any hybrids. And then they ended up with an 87. And they go, can you make me an A plus? No. Why? You didn't do any of the hybrids and it's too late now. I'm not grading them. Do the work. By the way, there's no due date on the hybrids. They're just due like the week before exams. So you got all term to do them. But I would recommend you do them with the course because, you know, they kind of go together. Um, there's two assignments. Yeah. Yeah, there's only six hybrids. So you do the first three during the first half of the course. You do the next three in the second half of the course. I've actually trimmed off how many hybrids. I used to have more hybrids and I gave up. Um, it just wasn't worth the effort. Um, assignments. There's two. They're worth 10% each. Other profs go with 5 and 15. My assignments are e about equally difficult, and they equally take about the same amount of time. Therefore, I give them equal weight. Um, I give you lots of time to come and see me to make sure you're going to submit something usable and reasonable. I've had cases where students came to me after failing the assignment and go, Sir, I don't understand why I failed. I go, it's the first time I've seen you in a, week, in a month. Maybe that's why you failed. I don't know. Uh, when I have the work time during the lecture and the lab periods, come and see me. I will verify your work and tell you if you're on the right track or not. Because, you know, I can at a glance tell you whether or not you're going to pass or fail the assignment. It's usually pretty obvious. Tests. There's two of them. 10% each. One is going to be right before the break. One is like two weeks before the end of the term. And that's it. Uh, then there's a two-part Final exam, one's a practical, one's theory. 
they're both 20%. Uh, the way I grade your final exam grade, because if you look at your course outline, it says final exam, 40%. What I do is I take the two, add them up together, since it's 20 and 20. You know, if you fail one, you do great on the other, you'll still get your passing exam grade. I'm not like the ones that say, well, you know, you must pass both halves with at least 51% because some people just suck at taking tests. My daughter sucks at taking tests. She can't take a test for life dependent on it. College should be fun for her. She started last week. So, you know, it should be a good time. Okay, this is what they call a 323 course. It's probably an acronym you may even not have heard from other profs. It means you got three hours of theory, two hours in class, one hour online, also known as hybrids. Some of my hybrids take 15 minutes to do. I'm just giving you an hour to do it. Two hours of lab per week. And technically three hours of study time. That's the official how much time you should be spending outside of class looking at your notes, you know, double checking what you've done. This is what the, the school has allocated for you time-wise. Depending on your mentality, you probably may not need the three hours. Here's the official pass the course, you must. You must write the final exam. Even if you come in and you get 1% on it, you come in, you answer like two questions and you leave. You have to write that exam. Sorry, that's the, the rules. I've had people literally come in and like answer like a quarter of the exam so they made sure they got their 80% and then they left. Yeah. No, the, the exam's a real exam. Well, actually, I, I'm not sure yet because last spring and this summer we did do it online before it was on Scantron. There, it's a mixed bag because the Scantron gives us some advantages that the online test doesn't. The online test gives us an advantage as in we don't need to grade them. Like you literally hit submit and then I watch your face crumble or you get all excited. It's very entertaining as a prof standing at the front watching people's expressions as they get their final grade. Um, I'm not sadistic, it's just really interesting. Just watching, no, but just seeing how people, just watching how people react, you know, you'll see people that, you know, have been serious all term, then they suddenly look like they're walking on cloud nine. And then you got people that were like laughing all the way through to the term thing and they're doing great and then they write the final exam, they're like, well, shit, <laughs> you know? So you have to write the final exam you must get 50% on the theory portion. That means you must at least, when you add up all your tests, all your hybrids, and your th theory exam, technically, you, as a gross, you must pass that portion. Same thing with the practical. That means on assignments, labs, practical exam, all put together, you're supposed to get 50%. In other words, if you manage to get 50% 50 in the course, you pretty much pass, because it's the only way to do it, is to get 50% in both halves. Um, you must complete both assignments and most labs. Um, although, depending on circumstances, I've given exemptions to that rule, just depends. Okay, supported hardware and software. Windows laptops, congratulations. Mac. I'm going to do my best for you, but I pretty much guarantee I can't help you if things go wrong. Just putting it out there. I don't know how to use Macs. So Macs and Parallels is weird. It does weird stuff. So yeah. Linux users, I probably none of them in this room, but I get usually one or two a term. Glorious neckbeards. Totally doable. I can help you. I work under Linux all day. If it wasn't for the fact that I actually need to use some Windows software, I wouldn't even use Windows on my machine at all. So yeah, if you're running Linux, no problem. I can help you. I can make it run way better than it does under Windows. Okay, so that's the course intro. The next slideshow is only nine slides long. So we should be done out of here in about half an hour if all goes well. Just saying the first lecture is usually short, right? Whoever it is that's setting up their laptop will probably be done before you're done setting up your laptop.
Okay, here's officially lecture one, because up till now that was the course introduction. As you can see, I don't spend an awful lot of time with the, the minutia of the course because you're going to learn it as you go anyways. It's a waste of time. I hate wasting time. Um, oh, crap, this place is full of, full of fruit flies. So, the first topic I talk about, which is actually something that people have a hard time grasping, is what is data? Data is unprocessed facts. Now, people will say, well, what the heck's the difference between a data and a fact? Now, facts is basically data about things. For example, here's a fact, the wall is white. Is that data? Sure. Is it information? Not necessarily. Because I'll explain the difference between data and information in a minute. It's everywhere around us. Literally, the entire world is data. Everything is data. Absolutely everything can be data. And this generation, those of you that are 18, 19, are getting used to not having any privacy. Your entire life is online. Your entire life is tap as you go. Tap my phone, tap my card, tap my bus pass. Trust me, we know exactly where you are, what you're doing, how much you're spending, and how long you've been doing it. Unless you're one of those people that's, that wears the little tinfoil hat and you pay cash for everything and you walk everywhere, avoiding, you know, you actually go subscribe to that uh, internet site that shows you where all the public cameras are and you avoid them. Pretty much your data is everywhere. Everything is data. What the weather outside is, is data. The color of the lights coming out of the fluorescence is data. It's all data. It's everything around us. Everything is data. All the things are data. For example, Let's talk about the weather for a second. That's something everybody understands. Wind speed, barometric pressure, humidity, wind direction, temperature, UV, pollen count, cloud cover. You know, even cloud cover. I mean, do you know how much data is in cloud cover? How high up off the ground is it? Is it thick? Is it thin? What kind of clouds is it? What direction is it moving in? Is it rain clouds or is it not rain clouds? It's all data. Totally, as it stands in its raw format, it's totally useless for anyone. I mean, you look at what a meteorologist looks at. They look at the raw data and turn it into something that might be accurate 10% of the time. But, you know, they work with the numbers and the, the data to turn it into information. So, there's something between data and information. It's called organized data. That's data that's been structured. You structure the data so that it's always laid out the same way so people understand what, how it's arranged. It's always organized the exact same way. It's been stored somewhere. Sounds a bit like a database. There's a structure. It's organized. Data is stored. That's what a database is. It's literally data that's been organized. Anybody here ever have to do a survey? Not as a person filling out the survey, but as the person running the survey. How much fun was that? How, how big was your sample data? Oh, that's nothing. So, you know, it, it can be a fair amount, you know, and I imagine if you're doing a survey with 10,000 people, there's 50 questions per. Yeah, exactly, brain blown. But uh, you can't, and if you had to do it on paper, as in, you know, you take each of the answers and you're tabulating individually each of those pieces of information, that's nightmarish. That's what databases are for. Now, back to my weather data. An example of organized data would be historical weather. On this date at this time, the barometric pressure was this, the ambient temperature was that, the UV levels were this. And based on this story, it's all organized so that this data is put in the same way every single time. Every single piece of in each block of information never changes. It's structured. The content may change, but the structure does not. Which brings us to information. <coughs> you take your data, you make it organized, and then you take that organized data and you transform it into something that's useful. And suddenly, you have information. 
for example, that wall is white. That's data. Now, if we went through the school and said, okay, let's see what all the different colors you're using on all the different walls in the place, you could say, well, 22% of the rooms in this school have white walls. That is information. White wall is data. What percentage of classrooms have their projector screen in a stupid place? I'm going to be using this, lost this term, just as exam for an example. Um, yeah. The, that is, once you take that raw data, organize it, and then you start working through it, then it becomes information. That's something people can work with. Uh, anybody here ever study stats? <laughs> Did you have fun? <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry. You're going to be playing with numbers again. <laughs> but not the same kind of numbers. Um, essentially, what is the difference between information and stats? There isn't. Stats are just basically information being transformed into, like, you know, imaginary numbers that can be put on a piece of paper as a report. Um, information is often summarized. It's then turned into reports. Uh, anybody here ever actually have to de deal with, with uh, end of day numbers for, for work? You know, at the end of the day, you run the totals out of all the cash registers or the tip outs or whatever, and then you got a magic number, and then that you give that to the accountant and they put it into their system. That is the daily sales summarized that the accountant can deal with. Today, we, spent, we sold this many things. This was our net for the day. This was our taxes for the day. We had this many orders for the day. And then if they want the details, then they worry about the details later. Uh, depending what kind of, you know, end of day you were doing, the amount of detail involved in that is pretty small. Um, so information processing is the process of converting the raw data into something meaningful for someone, which is what this whole course is about. So the goal is that you will learn how to collect the data, structure the data, and then you're going to learn how to query the data to make it something useful. Another example, going back to weather, weather trends is information. How hot is it? Your voice carries one, two, three, fourth row, two from the end, slap them. I can hear you over me. <laughs> Thank you. Next time I'm going to say harder. That was cute. Oh, slap. Okay. So weather trends, weather changes. Therefore, we're collecting all the data, we're organizing all the data, and based on that, we can actually see which way the weather is going. Apparently, the Earth is getting warmer. Surprise. And, or the winters are getting longer, you know, there's more dry days in the summer. Insert, re, you know, insert in a trend here. Hurricanes are getting stronger, et cetera, et cetera. So, now that I've talked to explain what data is and information, what is data modeling? Really? We went from talking over there to talking over here. I really don't mind people chatting, but your voices carry really well in this room. It's the first time I've taught in this room, and it carries really, really well. So, so what is data modeling? It's requ requirements gathering first. This is for any computer project. Whether it is you're buying a computer for your grandmother or you're going to create the next great database, whatever the hell that may be. The first thing you do is you've got to re collect your requirements. What do you need to collect? For example, I'm doing a database about oh, forget it. student meals. Okay, I'm pulling this one right out of there as I'm going. But student meals. And so in here, there's all kinds of information that I want to collect, right? I, I, I need to know what the, the gen general demographics are. Where do they eat? What are they eating? Does it make a difference if they have a cat or a dog? No. Does it make a difference what transportation they use? No. Actually, that might affect how they eat. 
they, if they're on the bus all the time, they might not be going to the grocery store getting lots of food, right? But, you know, that's, that's a side stat, not a major stat. But, you know, when you think about requirement gathering, you, when you start designing and modeling, you want to think about what's the most important information that you need and focus on that. Don't go off in the field collecting daisies. It's a waste of time. You're going to make things harder than they need to be and you're going to make things more difficult to understand. After you've figured out your basic requirements, you start exploring the data structures and you're going to be learning all about this later. And by exploring data structures, I mean, how can you organize the information, the data you're collecting? So for example, if I say, okay, well, let's think about a data structure, laptops. When we think about the data structure that defines a laptop, what are the things that would define a laptop? And they've got the brand, you've got the model, you've got how much RAM, what kind of CPU, what kind of video card, what kind of hard drive, how big is the hard drive, how much RAM do you have? What kind of video card do you have? How big is your battery? Do you have a sh stupid keyboard or not? Is it a Mac, unfortunately? You know, what operating system are you running? These are all data structures. Sorry, I just make fun of the Macs because, you know, they're Macs. It's nothing against Macs personally. It's just, they're just an easy target. Hey? Eh? Yeah, pretty much. So those are its data structures. So you want to think about what makes up your data. So you want to collect information that is similar together so that you come down to the most basic structure that defines it. Later on, next when I start talking about the modeling a bit later, um, I'll explain just what you're supposed to be targeting. Um, you'll be using words like entities, instances, and attributes during your initial modeling. I'll be defining that stuff next week because that's next week's lecture. It's the whole lecture. Uh, almost on those three words. Um, but it, th that's what you're going to use at the initial, at the modeling stage. Now, there's three kinds of models. There's the conceptual model. This is the model you use as a very high level diagram. Anybody here draw? Okay, you know how hard it is to draw a face, right? And there's a trick to it, right? You basically draw a, pl a, a, a T or like a perfect cross and then you draw your circle so you can keep the face in proportion because your eyes are right in the middle. Right, but there's a certain structure that you use. And the three levels are literally, the conceptual is basically you drew the circle. This, thing, this is where there's a face. The logical is you're now filling in the description of the face. In other words, you're putting the eyes and the nose and the lips. The physical is when you make it specific, right down to this is exactly what it's gonna be when it's implemented. So conceptual is the one you'd present to your customers saying, this is how I understand your data. The diagram is simple enough, even non-IT people should be able to understand it. It's very basic, it uses two symbols and one line. It's really not that complex. Then you've got the logical, which is basically the conceptual that's been filled out a little bit more. Then it'll have the attributes and all that jazz. Um, and then the physical is no longer uh, talking about entities and attributes, you're talking about tables and columns or fields. So you're talking about physical structure and it's usually targeted to a specific database server. So if you do a physical model for Postgres, it's not going to work on MySQL because things are a little bit different in each server. The logical should still work on all servers, if you understand what I mean. So conceptual diagrams includes important entities and relationships. In other words, all the major pieces are there in a broad stroke. It may or may not list the attributes. In other words, if it's what they call a regular conceptual diagram, there are no attributes. So in other words, you have, an, you have an, something called, a thing called a student, and that's it. You have a thing called a teacher, and that's it. If it's what they call an extended conceptual, then you have attributes. In other words, you have like a student number, student name, and a student address. More detail. There's no primary keys defined. I'll define what that means later. But there are no unique identifiers anywhere to be seen. Now, the logical diagram includes all entities and relationships. All the attributes have been defined. The primary key has been defined. Today I'm just doing definitions. 
foreign keys, which I'm also going to be explaining in a week or two, are there. And there's something called normalization, which will be your worst nightmare uh, when it's time to do that, because it sucks. And then the physical diagram specifies the table and the columns. Uh, foreign keys are actually created. And they happen. Some denormalization may happen at this point. Um, all that is explained later in the term. Uh, physical considerations can actually cause the diagram to diverge from the conceptual diagram. So in other words, when you start designing to your final target database, you may realize that some of the things that were in concept a good idea might not be a good idea. Everybody here has already experienced something at least once in their life where the concept sounds like a great idea, then you go to do it and it's not such a good plan. Most guys have done it. I'll, and if you're not willing to admit it to yourself, you've got problems because we've all done it. Probably most of us have scars because of concepts that weren't a good idea. But it's, it is what it is, right? So by the time you get down to the physical level, some of the things you thought of the concept may not be a good plan and you need to rethink it. And the physical data model will change depending on what database server you're using. A, di a physical diagram for Postgres, which is the one we're using in this course, is different than a physical diagram for MySQL. It'll be different than for Microsoft SQL Server or Oracle. It's just how it is. It's the nature of the beast. It's like saying, hey, I can take a part from a Ford and shove it in a BMW. That's going to work great. You got like maybe like maybe a screw from one to the other. No, actually, it won't because one's metric, one's imperial. So even that's still not going to work. But I'm just saying, like the parts are not interchangeable. So the physical diagrams are very specific. Um, this course will focus on conceptual and physical. So that means that you will learn the, how to create the concept. We're going to skip the logical, go straight to physical, um, because you can. Because the, the difference between a logical and a physical is one is specific to a machine, one's not. That's all. And um, that brings me to the end of that. So here comes to the end of this. Actually, I got through that in 15 minutes. Even better. Um, so here's co what's coming down the pipe. Um, this week, you should, if you haven't done lab one, you should try to do lab one. If you're having problems, please come see me at your next lab um, because I'll help you. Uh, two, if you don't have a functioning, a functioning laptop yet, I really think it's time you get on that. Just putting it out there. I've had students in the past say, by what week do I need a laptop? Yesterday is the answer. Sarcasm was coming out really hard on that one. Um, so, and then you'll be starting in on lab two. Lab two is not too hard. It's a, it's a point and click lab. I'm just getting, a lot of people are saying, well, I don't understand what I'm actually doing. What the point of the lab is, is not you knowing what you're doing when you're diagramming. I'm trying to get you guys to have a little bit of muscle memory. So later on, when you start diagramming, you know where the buttons are. Right, it's one of those things where um, when you learn how to drive, what's the first thing you learn? You, yeah, I learned to wait, for starters. Two, you learn, you sit in the car and you learn where everything is, right? Where's the blinkies? Where's the wipers? Where's the speedometer? Where's the ignition? Where's the gear shift? If you have not a standard, where's the clutch? You gotta learn where the stuff is, even though you don't know how to use it yet, you still have to know where things are. So the first, the lab two is literally Click on this, do this, put this here. Now, know what you just did, do it again, but call it this instead. So the lab literally walks you through by hand. Um, there's times where people don't understand. That's okay. I will point out where the icons are. Um, but that's lab two. Um, I'll be putting up an announcement with, uh, you know, what the recommended reading for the week is, uh, what the... Um, what lab should be, all that stuff will be going up on Brightspace either today or tomorrow morning. Uh, but other than that, yeah, you have to have a working laptop. You need to get lab one done so you can do lab two. Um, oh yeah, attendance policy for labs. I said I was going to talk about that. I forgot to mention it earlier. I don't take attendance at lab. 
If you do the work and you submit it online, congratulations, spare yourself coming into my class. It is what it is. I don't, you know, I don't see the point of taking attendance if you can do the work on your own. If you're having problems, please come see me. What that does is it thins out the room a little bit for people that are having problems. There's less people in the room so they don't feel as intimidated coming and asking for help if there's only like, out of 25 people supposed to be in the room, there's only 10 there. Odds are all 10 need help, therefore everybody's gonna be happy and they're probably gonna be listening to each other's help sessions with me and it's all gonna help them. So come to my labs if you need help. If you think you can do it on your own and you're not having any problems, that's fine, you don't need to come. I'm gonna treat you guys like adults, right? I'm not gonna babysit you, so that's that. Um, there's something, there was one more thing and I thought of it a second ago and I lost it. Now, I guess it wasn't that important. Um, yeah, I don't remember what it was. If I remember, I'll put it on Brightspace. <laughs> Oh, that's what it was, thanks. He reminded me. I allow you to float between labs. So if a given lab period does not work for you, you can come to another lab period. They're posted on Brightspace under contact information. The times and where I am. So you don't have to come to the lab you've been assigned, you can come to whichever one you want. But please, for the first two weeks, come to your own labs. After that, it's free game. Hey? Eh?